And welcome everyone to the 2023 AIAA Section Award presentation. Um, we're really excited to have you all here and we're very excited to be presenting these awards. We'll go through each of the categories, go through each of the, cat, uh, the section size um, descriptions and um, announce the winners and um, let you guys know that you, um, you're being recognized by all of us and, and we're very happy for you. The section awards are a way for us to provide additional funding to folks that do an outstanding effort in addition to the section rebates. And we're in the process of trying to rework the way we do section awards to make it more fair and equitable. But for now, um, this is, we're going with this method that we've been using for the past few years. The award period is 1 June to 31 May, which is um, the year of the section. The categories are communication, membership, young professional, public policy, section and student partnership, STEM K-12, outstanding section. And then we give out an outstanding activity award, which doesn't carry any monetary value, but which um, is a really good way to show other sections and other section leadership what you are doing that is working well for you in your section. And you get bragging rights and the ability to say, we did an event that everyone thought was fabulous. So um, that is the category. Uh, awards are given for first, second, and third place in the five size categories, which are very small, small, medium, large, and very large. And so I think that is all I have as an introduction and a welcome. Um, I thank you all for coming today. and. Um, Again, hopefully um, you, you win a prize. So with that, I will turn it over to the communications and Ellen. All right, well, up first is the communications award. It's presented to sections that have developed and implemented an outstanding communication and outreach program. In third place for the communications award in the very small category is Melbourne with Frank Papa. Um, the medium, uh, for a medium sized section, uh, Tucson is the, is the winner. And there was a tie uh, for the large category between North Texas and Cape Canaveral. In the very large category, third place goes to Greater Huntsville. Congratulations to our third place winners. Second place for communications in the very small category is Point Lobos. In the small category is Utah. Medium category, Illinois. Uh, large, Albuquerque. And very large, Hampton Roads. Congratulations to our second place winners. In first place for the communications award in the very small category, um, is Central Coast of California. Um, they inform their members of upcoming events using Engage. They sent out surveys. They were advertising for what kind of volunteers they needed. They worked with their student branches and they held combined events. Um, and they worked very closely with their secretary, taking notes and sharing those notes across uh, the region. Uh, they were also um, just the person who did this is Matt Tanner. He was an all around great guy and wonderful asset to the council and this section. Congratulations, Central Coast of California. In first place, communications uh, award for the very small category was a tie and that is for Delaware. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, the first place for the communications award in the small in, category in school uh, is Long Island, David Paris. Um, and what they did to help them qualify for that honor is they advertised their section meetings in a newsletter. They, um, they sent out announcement emails. Um, they published four newsletters including a chair chairman note, an airspace update note, and council members 
Um, they sent out meeting announcements. Um, they sent out Zoom meeting announcements and they worked with their local student sections. They had an essay contest and they send out a lot of emails to their members about upcoming events. Okay, first place for the communication word award in the small category, remember it's a tie, is Northwest Florida um, from Ryan Sherrill. Uh, he says, while we continue to post and engage, we have found the best way to communicate with our members is through the post office. Partnering with other professional organizations also increases the local pool of people interacting with AIAA. So that's really good. Maybe they sent some postcard reminders and they had some joint meetings. And that is a great way to boost membership and, and at your events and win. All right, first place for communications in the medium category was Greater Philadelphia. So congratulations to Jonathan Moore. He says, we've been utilizing several resources to keep consistent communication with our members. We have an annual scholarship. Um, we announce new AIAA council bios so that everyone knows who our council members are. Um, we have, um, uh, we boost uh, AIAA and other uh, events to improve attendance. Um, we've learned to share advanced details uh, in, in advance and to do it often. And they use different types of communication channels, usually email, but also engage newsletters and social media. This allows members to get several reminders without fee, um, through multiple channels. So congratulations to Greater Philadelphia. First place in the communications uh, for the communications award in the large category is Northern Ohio. Um, and that is Edmund Wong. Edmund says we provide membership with news and information on section activities, events, and opportunities through a variety of communication outlets, including newsletters, mailing lists, social media, event flyers, engage, and our they have their own website. Um, they work to enhance the visual appeal um, by doing some really creative um, and quality designs. Um, and they use consistent branding and they like to use a lot of photography. So congratulations, Northern Ohio. And first place communications award in the large category, this is a tie, is with Atlanta as well. Congratulations to Atlanta. They say our communications start with cool photos to encourage people to read our messages. And then we include more photos to keep them reading. All right. Way to go, Atlanta. All right. Uh, first place communications in the very large category is Los Angeles, uh, Las Vegas, and that's Kenneth Liu. Um, and Kenneth tells us that unexpected, oh, they lost their previous communication officer. However, they've been able to continue with newsletters that provide um, all kinds of information about their events. They also keep in touch with their members or people who they think could be potential members. Um, and they work with their membership offer to send reminders for renewals and for events. They use LinkedIn, Facebook, Book, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and they find that it's easier to communicate now that we've come out of the pandemic and we're doing in-person networking. Um, and they also use Airspace America. They've written articles for Airspace America and that gets their section some attention, which helps boost their events. So um, congratulations to Kenneth and the Los Angeles, Las Vegas section for your outstanding work in communications first place. All right, for the membership award. All right, the membership award is presented, oops, is presented uh, to sections that have supported their membership by planning and implementing effective recruitment and retention campaigns. So that means they do extra work to um, bring in new membership. All right, third place in the membership for the membership award in the very small category is the Central Coast of California. In the small category, the Utah, in medium size, Tucson. And there is a tie in the large category uh, for Atlanta and St. Louis. 
in the very large category, third place is New England. Congratulations to our third place membership award winners. In second place for the membership award, very small is uh, Ad Adele. Um, small category is Northwest Florida. Medium category, Greater Philadelphia. Large category, Orange County. And very large category, Los Angeles, Las Vegas. Congratulations to our second place membership award winners. All right, so our first place membership award, very small category, goes to Zachary Gant in Delaware. Congratulations. All right, so uh, uh, first place membership award in the small category is Wichita. They say their best practices are to target a monthly review of membership. They go through and they look and see what everybody's status is. Uh, they identify members whose membership is within two months of expiration, and they email those people to make sure that they get the reminders to renew. They also include information about upcoming section activities, and they encourage everyone to come out and take part in the events. So congratulations to Wichita. All right, first place for membership in the medium category goes to Illinois. Um, they had a very focused 22-2023 uh, year. They like to uh, recognize achievements. They, um, they like to boost membership through communication to the section by using Engage and by giving out awards and um, by having quarterly communications that engage with their members. All right, congratulations, Illinois. First place for membership in the large category goes to Northern Ohio. Um, the membership uh, they have a, a they have a dedicated membership chair, um, and they find that Lindsay, um, who is our staffer, provides excellent data. Uh, they get to visualize uh, the membership data by uh, by getting uh, getting the data and plotting it out, and they create visualizations. They have an automated process for generating their plots. They identify members who are about to lapse or are due for promotion, and they pass that information on to the communication chair so that they can um, get those people their promotions and make sure that their memberships don't expire. And they have meetups at, at, at the SciTech and Aviation Conferences, which is a great thing to do. And it looks like they have some nice pictures of when they get together. So congratulations to Northern Ohio. Okay, first place membership award winner in the very large category is Hampton Roads. So congratulations. Let's see what they have on there. It says their membership recruitment flyer is displayed at the annual pig roast event. And I bet they um, they display it at their events as well. Um, trying so that if you come and try out their event um, and you see that you like it and have a good time, the membership information is right there for you to take with you. Um, and it really helps because they have 50 fellows. Look, they have um, they make sure that people get their promotions. They have people from all different uh, levels, from honorary fellows to members to senior members, young professionals. And they actually have worked on their membership so that they have 707 professional members. So congratulations to Hampton Roads. Okay, I think I'm up next, Lindsay. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Thank hey, you. Hi. hi, everyone. I'm Jim Guglielmo. I am the Region 5 uh, Director, and I will be presenting the Public Policy Award winners. The Public Policy Award is presented for stimulating public awareness of the needs of aerospace research and development, particularly on the part of government representatives, and also for educating section members about the value of public policy activities. Our third place winners uh, for the very small section is Melbourne, medium size Tucson, large Albuquerque, and the very large section Houston. So congratulations to our third place winners for the Public Policy Award.
In second place for public policy, there's a tie uh, for the very small size section between Adelaide and also the central coast of California. Uh, medium size section, winner or second place winner goes to Illinois. Uh, large, Cape Canaveral, and for the very large section, uh, the Hampton Road section. Congratulations to the second place winners. Moving on to first place for the Public Policy Award, in the very small section size, we have Delaware um, coming in first place, and congratulations to Dee Anna Davis, who is their chair for public policy. In the small size section, there was a tie for first place. Um, Northwest Florida, and they are engaging local leaders on issues affecting um, their members and industry. And there you see a picture of one of their state representatives there. Um, so congratulations to Michael Kelton and the Northwest Florida section. Uh, this, the second tie for first place in the small section was goes to Palm Beach and Kevin Simmons, who is their a public policy chair. Um, some of the highlights of the activities that they've done, um, prepared and led 18 students to conduct adv advocacy with their state Florida legislature, um, secured $350,000 appropriation for aerospace technician training for at-risk youth, and looks like they've directed the funds to the college, Palm Beach State College, to conduct aerospace and innovation academy summer workshops. So very, uh, very Nice activities there for from Palm Beach. In our medium sized category, first place for public policy goes to Greater Philadelphia and Joyce Bragans, who's their public policy chair. So congratulations, Greater Philadelphia. Moving on to the large section, a first place goes to Northern Ohio and Michael Heil. Um, you see a picture there of Mike with the Ohio Aerospace Leaders at the 2022 Defense and Aerospace Forum in Columbus. And let me minimize that a little bit here on the top. So the public policy chair uh, represented their section, um, Northern Ohio section at the 2022 Defense and Aerospace Forum, which you saw the picture of. Um, one of their best practices that they wanted to share with everyone was uh, to attend state aerospace days and offer AIAA as a research for unbiased professional advice on aerospace issues to the elected and, and other type of um, officials. So congratulations to Northern Ohio and thank you for sharing one of your best practices. First place for the very large section, there was a tie. Um, the first tie uh, winner is the Los Angeles and Las Vegas section with Kenneth Louie and Roz Lowe as the, as the chairs. So a lot of, lot of activity here highlighted. Um, you know, all of us know CVD was canceled and that did make it uh, more difficult from a public policy standpoint. Um, they were implementing, um, or well, they tried to implement what was supposed to be done originally at CVD without CVD. Um, so that was a little more challenging. Um, they also noted that it's not as easy to connect to the local uh, leaders um, that, especially in the Los Angeles area, they have many competing groups that are very different. Um, but they did uh, have connections with a representative, Ted, or, uh, Ted Liu. Um, Let's see, cautions are needed. So I think they're a uh, best practice here um, that you, you gotta be careful when you are approaching these legislatures as not to get into any lobbying situations or endorsements um, as you know part of a, an AIA double sec section, avoid conflict of interest, money issues, sending converting members to others and, and so forth. So, and, and that also applies to, for some of us that are in industry, there's things that we gotta be careful when we're working with public policy. So that's always good to, to keep in the back of our minds. Um, also that needing a good understanding and respect for the AIAA and the section bylaws and, and be, be professional when you are meeting these representatives. You don't want to get into any controversial situations or difficult situations with the, with the representatives. Um, and you don't want to waste their time either or waste your time or damage the Institute. So it's always good to always uh, be respectful in any type of situation you're in, um, but also know that you are representing AIAA um, when you are 
uh, meeting with these um, representatives or legislatures for public policy. Uh, next slide, please. So the other tag goes to the Rocky Mountain section and Lisa Ludicky. Um, there you see pictured on the left is their aerospace day at the Colorado Capitol. So it looks very successful, a lot of a lot of attendees. Um, looks very, very successful actually event. Um, they also did a virtual series on topics related to public policy. So three there are shown, the moon and Mars exploration, space traffic management and space debris management. And some of the best practices they wanted to share with the other sections are um, to invite staff from some of the federal offices to activities as they uh, want to hear from the industry. Um, and the industry representatives from your section, and then also have activities around subjects the chapters and members find interesting related to the public policy field. So congratulations again to the two ties uh, for first place in public policy, Rocky Mountain section and Los Angeles, Las Vegas. I said, all right, good afternoon or evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Sherrill. I'm the Region 2 um, Director, and I'm going to present the STEM K-12 Awards. So this awards are presented to sections that have developed and implemented an outstanding STEM K-12 outreach program that provides quality education resources for our teachers in the STEM subject areas. So for uh, third place, um, very small is Adelaide, small is Northern New Jersey, medium is Greater Philadelphia, large was Northern Ohio, and very large was Los Angeles, Las Vegas. So congratulations to our third place winners. In second place, we have a, a tie for very small between Delaware and Point Lobos. The small section was Northwest Florida, medium was Phoenix, Large was Orange County, and very large, there is a tie between Huntsville and um, National Capital. So congratulations to our second place winners. So in first place for STEM K-12, very small was the Central Coast of California and Thomas Stevens. Um, so they did um, work with the American Rocketry Challenge for um, local qualifiers. They um, had five middle school teams that participated. And they also did the, um, the uh, 38th annual, so been going on for a while, Central Coast um, STEM expedition. So they had 131 projects, gave out $1,700 in um, cash and plaques. And their big lesson learned for the other sections was to hold uh, pre-event meetings with participatory leads determine the best dates to hold the events. That way, um, you know, if you choose, choose a good date, then um, you're gonna have um, good volunteers at events. So appreciate that best practice and congratulations to um, Thomas in the Central Coast of California. For the um, um, small was Palm Beach. And so they, um, they created um, their, um, uh, first annual small set education conference. It had um, 300 attendees and 24 presentations. They um, supported uh, 20 pre-college uh, student uh, presentations and presenters and um, had 18 students to conduct advocacy with the Florida legislature. And I believe that we saw that on the um, previous slide. So congratulations to Palm Beach. For um, the medium size sections, we had Tucson. And so um, they did a, a lot of um, let's see, outreach through um, artwork, apparently, so that they had um, helped students build motor rockets, decorate them, and then um, launch them off. And, you know, basically what kid doesn't like shooting a rocket off. So congratulations to um, Michelle in the Tucson section. In the large, we have um, Cape Canaveral. And so they had um, several things. They took, um, went to the, the county zoo, had a Civil Air Patrol teacher flight, um, Martian Greenhouse. They did a SciTech Educators Day Committee, um, a small SAT education conference. And then um, they did higher orbits go for launch. 
So congratulations to the Cape Canaveral and Melissa. And the other um, tie for um, large was St. Louis. Um, so they did um, community engagement with an AIAA booth, giving out um, swag and hands-on activities. And they also participated in um, air shows, STEM nights, and local conferences. So they also did a teacher professional um, development with um, the local, regional, and national teachers, once again, giving out good AIAA swag. And then uh, for the students, they give students opportunities to go to um, field trips, local airport, the St. Louis International Airport. And they also supported the STEM club with a, a very aerospace focus. So congratulations to Jackie and St. Louis. And in very large, um, Hampton Roads. So they had um, uh, participated in NASA Langley's 105th anniversary family day. They um, did the, um, the first Lego League scrimmages. They um, taught introductory classes at um, programming at the Naval Museum, had an egg drop competition. And they, um, I guess, yeah, we already mentioned the, um, the qualifying tournament for the first Lego League. So congratulations to Amanda, Karen, and the Hampton Road section. Uh, greetings, everyone, from, uh, from Melbourne, Australia. My name is Kay Spill. I'm the Region 7 Director. And it's my pleasure to present the award winners for the Section Student Branch Partnership Awards that recognizes the most effective and innovative collaboration between the professional section members and student branch members. So third place uh, for a very small central coast of California, Eva McLaughlin. Small section, Sydney, Dasha Weidman and Ramsell Leowen. Medium section, Greater Philadelphia, Jonathan Moore. Large was a tie, Cape Canaveral, Keith Sowell and uh, Central Florida, Walter Hammond. Orange County, Dino Roman. And very large a tie, Hampton Road, Silmo Duta, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Kenneth Liu and Luis Chevas, and National Capital, David Brandt. Congratulations, everyone. In the second place for a very small section, Adelaide, Harry Rolton. Small section, Twin Cities, Christine Terzina. Medium section, Tucson, Peter Olinek. And large section, St. Louis, Alexander Friedman and Mark Kammermeyer. And very large, Rocky Mountain, Cordero Orona. Congratulations, everyone. First place uh, uh, is in the, very, in the very small section, Central Pennsylvania, Puni Tsingla. Uh, they've met with student chapters overseas regularly and have one of the section overseas attend student chapters meetings. Uh, a very important activity and congratulations, Punit. First place uh, in the small section, Wichita, Linda Clement. They had several uh, activities which they conducted together with the students to the branches in their, in their section, including uh, distinguished speakers and uh, various meetings, including supporting the, the, the branches themselves as well. Congratulations, Linda. In first place, medium, Illinois, Laura, Filafane, Roca. And they, in, they, they collaborated with three branches within their section and uh, they actually met together. They had joint meetings, uh, which in involved also supporting the branches and various activities that they did, including offering awards and, uh, and scholarships. Congratulations, Laura. First place, large section, North Texas, James Sargent. Uh, they, they supported this, their student sections primarily through funding various activities, as you can see here, including the sponsoring their uh, contribution to the Spaceport American Cup, the rocket competition. And uh, I see very, a lot of smiling faces here on the photo. So that was a great event. Thank you, James. Congratulations. First place uh, is New England in the very large section. Thomas uh, call sign Phoenix Robbins uh, and Charles Wilson. 
um, they uh, had a number of best practices that they really like to, uh, to, to showcase here, visit their each branch uh, yearly, uh, encourage them to submit the annual reports, very important, and help student, uh, student branch leaders to, to develop their leadership skills, a very important activity. So thank you very much, Thomas and, and Charles. Congratulations. That concludes my presentation, heading over to Oleg. Thank you, Case. Uh, my name is Oleg Yakimenko, and I'm a director of Region 6. And it's my pleasure and honor to uh, present the winners in the Young Professional Activity uh, category. So this uh, award is presented for excellence in planning and executing events that encourage the participation of the Institute's young professional members and provide opportunities for leadership at the section, region, regional, and national levels. So the uh, leaders for the third place in this category are as shown here. So in the very small category, it's uh, Melbourne. Uh, in the small category, it's Twin Cities. In the medium category, we have Thai between three sections, Greater Philadelphia, Illinois, and uh, Tucson. And in the very large, uh, category we also have a uh, tie between Greater Huntsville and New England uh, sections. Congratulations to the winners and in, to the third place winners. Uh, the second place here um, goes to Adelaide in the very small uh, category, and then to Utah in small category, Indiana in the medium, uh, North Texas in the large section category and to Los Angeles, Las Vegas in the very large category. Congratulations to all the winners in this for the second place. So for the first place uh, uh, in the very small section category, uh, the award goes to Delaware, Tyler Coleman. And I think we were hoping to have some activities listed here, some specific activities, but probably for this time, uh, we didn't get the slide in time. Uh, for the first place in the small category, uh, the uh, award goes to Northwest Florida, uh, Prashant Ganesh. And uh, they uh, did some uh, uh, summer tech talks for the local summer interns. They also uh, made some presentations uh, to professional members and peers and uh, collected the feedback on the areas of improvement. The first place in the medium uh, section category goes to Antelope Valley, Joseph Petrovsky. And uh, they uh, have a goal of organizing different events for young professionals every month. Uh, they also took advantage of, of having the collaborative events with other professional societies and groups. Uh, they also uh, have some uh, events at NASA. Uh, at Air Force, Lockheed, Northrop, and uh, Strata Lodge in Turis. Uh, and they also tried some different approaches, including the uh, speed mentoring uh, for the young professionals. The first place in the large category, uh, there's a tie. Uh, uh, this is Kate Canaveral, Kenny Ovalas, and uh, uh, they featured fine, uh, good uh, venue for the events. Uh, they maintained consistent schedule. Uh, they invite uh, peers, uh, including non-IAAA members, and uh, you know enjoy themselves during these events. So the next, so I said that it's a tie. So the the the, the second section that got the first place in in uh, young professional activity category is Northern Ohio, uh, Halle Busher. And they had, as uh, shown here, they featured uh, five uh, young professional events throughout the year. And they established good practices, which includes uh, giving uh, plenty of notice before the event so the people can uh, uh, find the place in their schedules to attend. Uh, they say, uh, they send uh, the, the invitation, you know, specifying the location, cost, website of venue, and all other relevant information. Uh, they also sent personal messages to everyone, and uh, they made reservations at least a week in advance uh, with several slots to, uh, again, make uh, the most attendance of these events. 
All right, in the very large category, the first place goes to Hampton Roads, Kyle Thompson's, Thompson. And they have a board, a young professional section board, composed of Brett Hiller, Kyle Thompson, and Morgan Walker. Uh, so they are net 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 networking with their fellow uh, members from IAAA and also from the NASA uh, Language Research Center. Um, they are organizing the professional uh, lectures uh, for the young professionals. And uh, they also have two awards, uh, section awards that they're giving out each year, Lawrence Permanent Young Professional Paper Award and Robert Mitchell Tree Young Engineer of the Year Award um, as well. So congratulations to all the winners in this category. And uh, with this, I'm giving the, the stand to uh, Jane. Okay, I am going to present the awards for the outstanding section. And these awards are presented to sections based on their overall activities and contributions throughout the year. So it's a concatenation of all of the activities that you did, not just in the categories that we recognize, but all the activities that you provided for your membership. Next slide. So for the Outstanding Section Award, we have um, an honorable mention in the very small section, which is Melbourne. And our third place um, winners were Delaware for very small, Palm Beach for small, Illinois for medium, North Texas for large, and Rocky Mountain very large. Congratulations to the third place winners in the Outstanding Section Award. In second place for the outstanding section, we have in the very small category, Adelaide. We have in the small category, Wichita. In the medium category, Greater Philadelphia. In the large category, Cape Canaveral. And in the very large category, Hampton Roads. Congratulations to the second place winners for the outstanding section award. In first place for the outstanding section in the very small category is Central Coast of California. And this is their uh, executive council that helps put on and plan all of the activities that they do throughout the year. Congratulations. First place for the outstanding section in the small category is Northwest Florida. And uh, this was based on primarily for them supporting their science night at local schools. They co-hosted a symposium, and they had some technical talk opportunities for young professionals. Congratulations, Northwest Florida. First place for the outstanding section in the medium category is Tucson. In Tucson, they did um, a lot of technical activities, uh, a dinner with the Blackbird aircraft, many lectures on hypersonic flight research activities around the world. And some of their best practices were many sizes of membership engagement. So like for the STEM club, they do three months of weekly classes. That's a pretty big investment for grades four through six. Um, they do quarterly industry nights. Um, and then they support the University of Arizona students by helping them with their DBF fundraising and making AIAA um, more prominent by selling uh, Hawaiian shirts with AIAA logo on it. And they also joined the new Arizona STEM Adventures Community Outreach event, and that engaged with over 500 students. So congratulations, Tucson. First place for the Outstanding Section Award in the large category is Northern Ohio. And they had a great year this year, 2022-2023. Uh, they were, did some technically engaging lectures, they did a lot of STEM outreach, and they did some social networking. Um, and again, having that nice mix of those different types of activities, I think, draws in different, potentially different areas of your membership, so that was a great idea. Focus on early career leadership and brought energy to the section, so that's great. Congratulations, Northern Ohio. And finally, for the first place for the outstanding section in the very large category is the LA Las Vegas section. And they did a lot of um, professional out kind of council meetings. They um, were trying, trying to showcase what professionalism brings to the committee and allows them to do. 
Um, so they also had a code of conduct that um, they all had to sign, and they tried to help the people enjoy volunteering as much as possible so that everyone would want to be part of their leadership council. So again, congratulations to LA Las Vegas. And now our final award is the Outstanding Activity Award. Again, this acknowledges sections that have an outstanding activity that was deserving of additional recognition. And um, we will have each one of the winners go ahead and describe their activity. So starting with the very small category, we have Melbourne and their International Moon Day 2022. There's someone from Melbourne. Um, let me, I'm sorry, I know this. Kaya at Aunt Ledge, you yes, are going to present this slide. Thank you, Kaya. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this award. Um, it's already morning, Friday morning here in Melbourne, Australia. And um, we are really pleased to receive this, which is a great, um, not only achievement, but opportunity to be even better next year. So we understand we set up quite high standards, but speaking of this um, um, event uh, that was um, actually part of the first inaugural International Moon Day uh, in 2022. Um, you may all be aware that the United Nations proclaimed the 20th of July to be International Moon Day. And we partner with the um, uh, Moon Village Association um, who created these global events. They created one big event and then invited different, um, uh, different uh, space enthusiasts to provide um, how they call it bottom-up events so uh, we were encouraged uh, to create an event uh, for the australia region and um, this is actually the, the 21st of july for us and we invited a distinguished speaker from australia as well as an international speaker as a keynote from the us uh, the main idea was to um, provide inspiring topics um, and also to include uh, humanities and social sciences and not only um, engineering and science related topic. So uh, we were discussing Australian um, achievements and opportunities, um, past, present and future related to sustainable uh, lunar exploration. So um, in terms of the um, keynote speaker, um, we invited Michelle Anlon from For All Moonkind, uh, who talked a little bit about how to protect uh, historic achievements um, in uh, relation to um, the moon. Uh, we also invited um, Dr. Alice Gorman, um, who is a space archeologist, uh, then Dr. Kerry Doughty, who um, is uh, specialized in um, Australian um, uh, space uh, history. Then we had um, a speaker, uh, Knight Taylor from uh, the International Space University alumni group from Australia and New Zealand, as well as uh, James Brown, from, who is an executive um, Chief Executive Officer from uh, Space Industry Association of Australia. Obviously, when you have uh, such events, um, some things can happen. And unfortunately, James was not able to join, but we were fortunate enough that uh, his colleague, Tim Parsons, was able to jump in. And after Michelle's talk, uh, we had a really lovely um, Q&A session, which was some kind of a networking event for everyone and uh, our um, uh, treasurer summer russell um, was uh, doing a fantastic job to um, really run um, this uh, talk um, you can still uh, enjoy our event on youtube channel of the um, moon village association if anyone is interested um, but yeah, I would like to thank um, our section as well as um, Adelaide to help us out in this uh, first um, uh, days of um, 
putting together this uh, section. Um, Daniela uh, Papa joined us later as a treasurer, uh, sorry, as a, um, uh, a secretary, um, and also um, yeah, everyone who was involved uh, in this event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kaya. That was, that was a heck of a um, an undertaking there for a new section, and we really appreciate what you did there. That was awesome. Uh, the Outstanding Activity Award for the small section goes to Long Island, landing on the moon from the LM to the HLS with John Conley, Human Landing System Program Manager at NASA and the Artemis team. And we will ask Dave Paris to discuss what you guys put on there. Okay. David was not able to join us today, uh, but this is Gregory Hamadis. I'm the vice chair. <clears throat> and okay, uh, welcome. Hi there. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, okay. what we do is we uh, we publish. We had 169 people sign up. Maybe not so many came, but it was a hybrid presentation, both at the Cradle of Aviation Museum and on Zoom. So uh, we had a pretty big turnout uh, as a result, and we co-sponsored to other uh, local engineering societies and other technical societies and astro the astronomy clubs, and uh, we got a pretty good turnout. Th that seems to be our uh, formula for success, that, that we, can, uh, <clears throat> we can sponsor, uh, we can basically publicize to a lot of groups, and we can get a pretty okay turnout. Uh, I'd like uh, Joe Fregola of Long Island Section. He, he can talk a little bit more about the program itself, if you'd like. Joe, uh, may, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the program itself. Sure. We invited John Connolly uh, from NASA, Houston. He spoke about uh, landing on the moon, very specifically about the lunar module. And uh, as we had the presentation at the Cradle of Aviation Museum, we have one of the lunar modules there that didn't fly. And then he spoke about the human landing systems that are being considered by NASA for the future lunar landings and the precursor missions like the Artemis program, including the first Artemis I mission and then the Artemis II mission, which is planned for next year. Connolly is a long-term uh, NASA employee, a very venerable person, was involved in uh, much of the planning that was done for the Constellation program, and uh, his lecture was, was uh, outstanding. Uh, we got all sorts of compliments after the lecture from people who attended, and uh, uh, we were very pleased that he had the we had the opportunity for him to show up. That's it. Well, Thank thanks. It much. sounds like it was yeah. a really good event, and congratulations. Really, it was good. Mm -hmm. Next, the an honorable mention for the outstanding activity award goes to a small section in Wichita for To the Moon and to the Planets Beyond, What is the Future of Artemis HLS? And for this, we're asking Ed Feltrup to come and describe your activity to us. All right. Are you well, here? Well, thank you for the honor. And uh, uh, probably like many of the other sections, uh, you know, the, a lot of our efforts over the last year or so have been uh, to try to rebuild enthusiasm and engagement following, uh, you know, following uh, being shut down during the COVID, you know, uh, pandemic. So, uh, in particular, we've been uh, we've been working pretty hard to uh, to uh, you know better engage uh, the student chapters. And uh, we had had we have uh, chapters in Wichita at Wichita State University. Uh, KU, uh, we, the chapter at K-State has been dormant for some time and is just getting going again. And then we have a new chapter starting at UMKC last year. So um, during my visit with the UM, uh, UMKC faculty sponsor, he put me in touch with a friend and colleague of his, Alicia Dwyer Sianciola, who's the current, uh, tech, she's the current team lead for the NASA Artemis 3 systems engineering team. So uh, 
we uh, we invited Alicia to come and speak with us about uh, her, uh, her current role and uh, the, the 20 years of experience she had as part of the, the Mars exploration mission. So she's been part of each of the landers over the last 20 years uh, uh, with the Mars programs as well. So so uh, uh, to further our, our efforts in uh, connecting all of these campuses, we hosted this at KU, which is sort of centrally located, and our goal was to you know, was to uh, uh, to allow the more experienced KU team to build relationships with the other two and uh, build connections to help them get their chapters going. Uh, we also did this as a hybrid meeting, so it was it was made available via Zoom uh, throughout Region 5. And um, Alicia's presentation was fascinating, so she spent a lot of it talking about, uh, well, first of all, uh, she grew up in Nebraska, so she, you know, so she, uh, she's able to provide a fairly inspiring example to, you know, the other Midwestern students that are participating here to, let, you know, to let them see how you can get from, you know, a farm kid, or, or, you know, a, a child of the Midwest to, uh, you know, to a role like she has at this time. Um, she talked a great deal about the technical challenges of landing at the South Pole of the Moon, which I think a lot of folks probably don't understand. It, uh, it was, it was pretty fascinating. So. Uh, so she's a speaker that I would highly recommend, you know, for uh, future events. Um, as far as uh, lessons learned for us, um, we, uh, well, first and foremost, we, we uh, uh, in retrospect, we scheduled this meeting fairly poorly. So we put it the week before a lot of the schools went on spring break. And more, uh, more detrimentally, we, uh, we, it was coincident with March Madness and KU was playing and uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the game in, the, in Kansas City on the night of this event, which we would have had no way of knowing. So that suppressed our, uh, our turnout, uh, at least our in-person turnout. So uh, we will probably avoid March uh, altogether for future events. Um, we also ran into some issues with uh, live streaming that uh, we, we thought we had the details ironed out in advance, but uh, but at you know at the time of the event we we ran into some uh, some problems with some of the folks scattered around Region Five, so uh, we'll have to you know we will have to spend a little more time to make sure that uh, future events you know uh, don't give us those challenges. But uh, other than that, the event went very very well. It was uh, was very well received, and uh, I look forward to uh, bringing Alicia back uh, perhaps after Artemis Two or maybe again after Artemis Three. Thank you, Ed. Um, it sounds like that was a, a really fun event, and and it is interesting when you're trying to schedule with student branches. You know, they all have different schedules, and you you get focused on trying to get the students there and in track of March Madness. So you know, you'll have that. The next outstanding activity award for a medium section goes to Antelope Valley and Jason Lechniak. Jason, can you describe what? Uh, thanks for the award. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, the event uh, was a um, joint event with SETP, SFTE, and some industry partners. Um, this was actually a brainchild of somebody else, um, and we were included. Um, the meetings were um, not putting this on a good uh, on a good path forward. So we kind of um, partnered with one of the industry partners and um, gave some suggestions and then became the lead of this. Um, our normal um, talks, um, our dinner talks are 50 to 70 pe people each. And so that's pretty big, but this one could have been as much as 200. So we were kind of playing out of our box here. So it was good for us. We learned a lot. Um, Let's see. Um, so yeah, we coordinated um, a lot of the things. Um, we got all the partners to agree to even sharing everything um, and um, being accountable for uh, everything during the meetings. Um, and things like SETP stood up and um, they have a way to pay online. So we were able to have prepaid. Um, not have to deal with that at the door, and um, and uh, that helped things go a lot smoother. Um, as you can see, we made this uh, flyer. 
uh, and um, it tells you about the event. Uh, Doug Shane was the uh, was the keynote, if you will, um, and he talked a lot of his experience in scaled composites, and he was very candid. Uh, it was a very good talk if you were there. Uh, and then the rest of the panel talked about their experience with first, first flights. Um, and um, I unfortunately didn't get to see much of it, um, but it was very well received, and I think everybody liked that quite a bit. Um, let's see. Uh, so it went very smooth um, with the prepayment again. Uh, the event uh, center that we had took a, care of a lot of the logistics. So there wasn't too many logistics for us while we were supporting. Um, and, um, and it was covered by public affairs uh, for the Air Force. And that's where that picture at the top came from. Uh, it's from their website. And they have a blurb about, uh, about the event. Um, and uh, yeah, my lessons learned, which is what I focused on here, was um, if you lead as many aspects as, po as possible, then you're not assuming other people are doing them um, and dropping the ball, which we've had happen in the past. Um, and understanding the host site requirements. Uh, they told us we had a limit of people at the start, and then uh, there was super interest in this event. There was 170 people attending uh, and more wanted to attend, so people were trying to squeeze in and get in special agreements and all that. Um, and then so some of that worked out and some of it wasn't, didn't, and it caused a lot of friction, at least for me. Um, but if I understood that the, the event site was more flexible in attendance, that would have helped a lot. Um, but they weren't upfront about that. And um, yeah, and then I already covered secure agreement with partners. Um, we didn't make any money, but we didn't really lose any money on this event. We were pretty straight even. Um, but, you know, big events like this, you can take a hard hit or you can possibly make some money and that causes um, strife between the partners um, afterwards. So I wanted to make sure that was cleared uh, up front. Thanks, Jason, and congratulations. This sounds like it was a pretty big event. Gosh, 170 people, that's, that's crazy. Yes. Um, so congratulations. And um, we also have an honorable mention for the Outstanding Activity Award for the Medium section, and that would be Phoenix taking flight. And Paul Cap will hopefully <clears throat> describe this. And Jane, this is Scott Faust. I was going to uh, start with the intro and then uh, hand it over to Paul. Um, so I was okay. the former chair of the Phoenix section. Um, you know, Paul, who's a uh, Southwest Airlines captain, uh, he has this particular passion for supporting uh, STEM and, and really getting kids to understand and be literate with STEM and, and technology. So Paul came onto our section, and then last year we asked him to become the chair of the of the um, of our of our STEM activities. And uh, but Paul's been putting on these events uh, for a few years, um, and uh, it is an amazing event. You might characterize it as a science exposition. It's held at the East Valley Institute of Technology. Um, Paul sent a, a a chat earlier in this meeting. Um, which is out near the old Williams Air Force Base. But one of the things I want to point out, well attended, 500 people, really well attended by uh, teachers. So the 80 plus teachers that come here and they're collecting all kinds of ideas of things to introduce into the classroom. Um, the a wide range of people, you know, and you see families coming in with all their kids and, and, it, and it truly is a hands-on event. The kids are, have, We've had uh, first robotics uh, technical challenge activity, so the kids can be controlling the robots. They can go out and fly uh, RC airplanes. We do rocket launches. Um, it it really is amazing in terms of the impact that uh, this uh, Paul and this event has had in terms of stimulating kids. 
And so with that, I just went, oh, and I, the other thing I wanted to mention, we get we get industry coming in, Honeywell, Boeing, they've all had booths here, universities and academia. So Embry-Riddle comes down, so they're well represented. And so, but with that, I just want to give Paul a chance to talk about it and talk about some of the lessons he's learned from putting on this event. So Paul. <clears throat> Hey everyone, and uh, right off the bat, um, I would welcome any section that's nearby uh, in uh, joining us or participating in this event, Tucson, LA. Uh, we have people that come from as far as Seattle, uh, Muncie, Indiana. Uh, the Academy of Model Aeronautics is gonna be at the event this year. I happen to be an AMA. Um, I serve multiple roles at the AMA. Um, and they're coming out to uh, witness this event They've already witnessed the event, but we're having a foam board glider challenge. And we've got about 400 students signed up for this foam board glider challenge. Uh, for It's geared toward high school students. But the AMA is specifically coming out this year to witness the event and how we handle it to make this like a national uh, event for high school kids to be to engage them in aviation, aeronautics, and aerospace. So anyway, uh, just a super fun. I'm, I'm just a big kid, and I totally enjoy doing this stuff, putting it together. I have a team of guys that uh, help make help make this happen, guys and gals, and uh, bringing the AIAA into this and getting us involved in this section has just been uh, uh, tremendous and uh, a lot of fun along the way too. <clears throat> Over to you, Jane. <clears throat> Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks, Paul. And I might point out that Scott is also one of the domain leads for the AIAA. He is the R&D lead for, um, again, for the AIAA domains, which is a, a mechanism to try to become more relevant, not miss opportunities, stay on top of things, get into the forum, leading edge ideas and concepts, and also um, influencing, again, um, influencing public policy as well as uh, interacting with other societies. So for all of those things, um, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Paul. I want to, I missed saying after Jason talked that, um, you know, we often get questions if it's okay for AIAA to team with other societies or other engineering organizations. And that's not only okay, it's, it's strongly encouraged, but as Jason points out, there's a few little um, gotchas that can happen, so you need to make sure that you have a firm understanding of who's doing what to whom and how the profits, if there are any, will be split, how the expenses, if you don't make money, will be split. But if you can pull that off, you know, more hands make, make the work lighter. So um, I strongly encourage that. Uh, the next thing, the next award for the large section category in outstanding activities goes to another type of collaboration, which is Cape Canaveral and Palm Beach, who um, work together as two AIAA sections, which is also strongly encouraged, to put together their small SAT education conference. And we have Kevin Simmons and Kevin Johnson here to talk about how that event went. Gentlemen. Thank you, Jane. Uh, this is Kevin Johnson here from the Cape Canaveral section. And first, we wanted to thank you for recognizing and acknowledging this activity award. Myself and Kevin Simmons had started on this one very early, uh, probably around the January time frame for an October event. Um, large amounts of collaboration, as you can imagine, to bring this one home, as we did end up with over 300 attendees, both local and digital, with folks from as far away as Scotland and Peru making their way down to the Florida region where we did our event at the Cape Canaveral Visitors Complex outside of the Kennedy Space Station. Um, for this activity, we did end up having a two-day conference that featured folks from, like I said, all across the world, demonstrating various technologies, best practices, and other types of outreach related to small satellites. And in particular, their educational use within the K-12 STEM region, as well as collegiate level. We did have a lot of lessons learned out of this event, including one of the biggest ones was finding something relevant to our region, staying organized, and then shamelessly outreaching at every opportunity possible. That meant going to events around the area, advertising, calling folks that you know for doing some types of presentations, as well as just general outreach across the board for any activity you can think of. 
And Kevin Simmons, would you like to give some more information on the actual technical aspects of the event, as well as some of the topics that were presented? Sure. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, the origin story for why we wanted to do this is I've been taking pre-college students to small sat in Utah for years, and it's just too expensive. It's on the other side. It's, it's too expensive of a trip. So we wanted a way for educators. The primary focus of our conference is educators and pre-college students. And the way we reached out to them was, or the way we wanted to engage them was to use companies, but especially undergraduate CubeSat teams or high altitude balloon uh, students engaged in that type of research. So we had uh, universities from the Naval, uh, we had presentations from the Naval Academy and, and schools in Tennessee and uh, several in Florida um, uh, that came and spoke about their programs and their engagement. Um, also, um, we were able to uh, find a benefactor and we actually gave away 15 1U CubeSat emulators to teams in Peru. So we had a representative from Peru there. Uh, so we were trying to help those that are excited about aerospace, but they may not have resources. A couple of the other ways that we engage young people, we actually had an art contest and a 3D printer, a 3D uh, printer design competition. And, and as, as Kevin Johnson mentioned, we found a company that would donate, say, a 3D printer as a prize for the students. So we tried to find ways to bring in teachers and students. The nicest thing I think as a, also as an educator is that it was free for students and teachers to come to our conference. Now this year, we're having our conference on 28 and 29 October, our rent for our facility inside the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center, it went up substantially, but we're still only charging $20 for students, $20 for teachers. If any of you haven't submitted your abstracts yet, you have until midnight tonight to submit an abstract for our conference this year. And again, as Kevin said, we really appreciate you guys taking a, a, giving us a chance to share about our conference. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds very interesting. I'm so glad that you guys shared all of that information. It's always nice if you can give free entrance to students and teachers, but at some point that, that becomes unattainable. So I'm sorry that happened, but um, $20 is pretty reasonable. So thank you and congratulations. And part of the tie for the large sections and outstanding activity award was the Niagara Frontier section, talking about the Bell X175th anniversary commemoration. And for that, I will ask Walter Gordon to tell us a little bit about your event. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. And I wanna apologize in advance, I have uh, more than one slide because I wanna give everyone a, a feel for the event and then talk about you know, some challenges and some lessons learned. Uh, so October 14th, 1947, the Bell X-1 broke the sound barrier, a very big deal. The aircraft was made uh, in Niagara Falls, New York, right in the heart of the Niagara frontier section. 75 years later to the day, uh, we held a commemoration on the floor of the CalSpan flight research hangar uh, within walking distance to the original X-1 loading pit, which was next to the Bell Aircraft plant. And uh, we had an introduction by Dr. Bill Barry, uh, the immediate past NASA chief historian, and then a, a keynote address by, uh, by Dr. Richard Hallian, a former Air Force chief historian who arguably could be the world's foremost expert today uh, on the Bell X-1. Uh, next slide, please, Lindsay. Going to show you a couple of pictures. It helps that CalSpan in their lobby has a full-size, stunning replica of the X-1. Uh, everyone gathered around that and, and loved seeing it. it it's beautiful. Uh, slide, Lindsay. Uh, here is the floor of the CalSpan hangar with our tables. Uh, we are surrounded by experimental aircraft. You can see one of their uh, variable stability fly-by-wire Lears there. There was also another Lear and uh, one of their Gulfstream 3s. A slide. Uh, Paul Schifferly, uh, member of our council, a uh, vice president at CalSpan. We had a ton of uh, University at Buffalo students at the event. And during the, the social hour beforehand, he was taking them around and talking to them about some of the finer points of their aircraft. Uh, slide. It helps if you have a uh, hundred year old member, Bell employee who actually worked on the X-1, Bill Swenson. We didn't schedule this. He was just there. That was terrific. Slide. And of course, there's uh, there's Bill Barry. Slide. 
There's Decalion slide. And here are uh, a huge gaggle of uh, mostly University at Buffalo students, but quite a few other people too, that are standing in the exact spot where the Bell loading pit was, uh, the X-1 loading pit in 1947, where they loaded the X-1 on the B-50 aircraft. And you can see uh, that it's the same spot slide. So just some pointers, plan well in advance. I remember back in 1997, Dick Hallion spoke at the official Air Force event for the 50th anniversary at Edwards. And I had reached out to him a number of years ago and got him to commit to ours for the 75th. Uh, coordination with CalSpan uh, to host at the hangar took some time. It was obviously a wonderful venue. Uh, ridiculous process for a temporary New York State liquor license. We weren't holding it in a restaurant, so we needed to get a permit from the state to serve the wine and beer that we did. And publicity, we just uh, fell short there. We didn't do as much of it as we uh, should have. We didn't get much local press and uh, that I'm very disappointed there. Funding, uh, speaker travel, we had uh, told Dr. Hallian that we would cover his expenses in advance via the Distinguished Lecturer Program, and then that was cut off. So we had to uh, cover that out of section funds. Also, we subsidized all the student members uh, because of the uh, how nice the event was. We were charging $50 a ticket for the catered meal in the CalSpan hangar, and we subsidized that down to $25 uh, for the student members. Uh, overstaff and be flexible. Uh, I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off, and we almost didn't have uh, someone to take the people out to the X-1 loading pit site, but one of our volunteers stepped up and asked me if he wanted to do that, and he did. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't have had that part of the event. Uh, obviously, consider streaming to a larger audience, which we did, if it's appropriate. And uh, just the keys to an outstanding activity of this type with a speaker, you know, have a topical subject, have a great speaker, and, uh, and broad audiences. We've won outstanding activity twice before, and both times were with Alice Bowman, who, of course, is a, is a fantastic speaker. She spoke about New Horizons flying by Pluto and Arakoth. And we also had her speak at several venues, uh, to a STEM audience at the Niagara Aerospace Museum, to an evening adult audience at the Niagara Aerospace uh, Museum, and then to an official AIAA dinner event. So uh, the more you can spread the wealth, the better. It doesn't have to be a, uh, a single discrete event. And uh, that's all I got, thanks. Thank you, Walter. That looks like it was a pretty fun activity and, um, and very well organized. It was big, there were a lot of people there in that hangar. Mm -hmm. And rounding out the three-way tie for the large section Outstanding Activity Award is Northern Ohio with their Young Astronauts Day and Emily Armbrust if you are here, would you please uh, explain your event to us? Yes, hello. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for recognizing Young Astronaut Day. Um, this has been a event that's um, been an annual event since 1992. Um, and every year, it's been such a great turnout. Um, there was one year where there was 300 students at a single event. Um, but this past year, uh, we had a guest speaker. Uh, she was an engineer that recently uh, retired um, from NASA Glenn Research Center. And she talked about uh, kind of the difference between a scientist and an engineer, um, and then did some interactive um, tests with the kids with rocketry. Um, but every year, um, there's a general keynote speaker. Um, in the past, we've had astronauts speak. Um, and then it proceeds with multiple activities for the students to engage in uh, and to learn about relevant industry related work. Um, and this past year, so 2022, um, we coupled it with the Artemis One launch with our theme. So it was moon to Mars. So it was relevant to what was happening in the space industry. Um, and then the activities matched up with the theme, enabled the students to learn about things like rovers, tire design, programming, rocketry, and space communication. Um, like you can see in the pictures, there's a kid who did some programming and now his rover is moving through the rocks and then another girl that made a paper rocket and she's launching it. Um, and then 
One of the things that was really notable is the students love to compete with each other. So there was teams from different schools from around um, the Cleveland area that would come in and um, eat, they would pair off into twos and go around and complete all of the activities. And at the end, we had like a little award ceremony where some of the students got ribbons and it really showed like how passionate they were to like compete with their friends, but then also learn um, about STEM related uh, topics. So you can see the picture of all the students down there. We had 170 um, people attend that event this past year and um, looking to grow in the future. Um, but a couple lessons learned, um, venue is a big one, um, getting that uh, reserved way out in the future, um, being really flexible, like other people have said, um, and then also having that competition aspect when reaching out to the students. So yeah, Young Astronaut Day um, is approaching, I think it's 30th year soon. So um, big thank you to all the people that have contributed to it over the past couple of years. And um, pictured here is uh, Ashley Flagel and she was the lead for it for the past eight years and now I've taken it over. So it's a really great event all, all together, but thank you. Thank you, Emily. That sounds like it was a very great event and I'm glad that you were able to put that together and share what you did with us. We'll move on to the very large sections. And again, there was a tie. The Outstanding Activity Award, one of them, if I very large, went to LA Las Vegas. And we have Ken Louie here to describe the activity and the event. Ken. Hi, uh, uh, thank you, Jane. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Jane. And uh, for thank you for headquarters for recognizing this uh, wonderful uh, event. Uh, uh, this event actually is very interesting. And uh, at the same time, you know, um, the topic itself, you know, for the uh, reusable space, uh, which is the origin for all the space egg origins. So it's very exciting. Uh, and uh, you'll probably see that uh, from what I'm going to say is a little bit uh, different from what uh, uh, several of folks uh, were talking about. Um, um, but that's okay. This is one of the uh, one type of the event. And I would do this is for me, this is something like a gift from heaven or something like that. I will explain it more. Um, anyway, this was a very exciting event, you know, just from the topic. Personally, uh, I have been following the news for DCX since the uh, uh, the beginning of this project in the 90s. And uh, I've been um, probably five or six years ago, I have been looking into an A level event uh, with this topic, but it's been very difficult. I talked to many people, it was not very successful uh, locating the uh, proper people. But you know what? It's just like, uh, as I said, it's a gift from, from heaven because uh, two or three years ago, when Oleg and uh, uh, Dan, uh, our, our executive director, Dan Dunbarker, and uh, Lindsay uh, visiting our Los Angeles uh, Las Vegas chapter. And um, uh, we have a dinner talk, a uh, dinner, dinner conversation. And it turns out that Dan was citing a story about his son, you know, uh, def tried to defending uh, his father and uh, the, uh, the team in NASA. And I suddenly realized, yeah, we, we got a wonderful uh, uh, team here. And uh, so I asked Dan, and Dan was very happy uh, to support. Then we uh, uh, then gradually developed into a panel of five. And actually, there were more uh, people from this team, and gra gradually, just like a snowball. And uh, and also, another thing why I say is a gift from heaven was that, yes, we planned it, tried to plan it, but you know things like this doesn't happen every day. And the other issue that we have been struggling at that two issues we were struggling at that time last year was the post pandemic uh, attendance because the people, many people still didn't want to come, come out for in person or uh, in person event. The second big issue was uh, we were kind of uh, in the process of in search of the value of AWA and searching the soul of AWA. And uh, because we we're, were noticing, you know, um, certain issue that uh, people may not be staying or try, uh, try to question what is the reason they have to join AWA. And um, so we are not trying to chase the number of attendees or uh, certain kind of uh, things. You know, we, we are just find why, what's the reason, how, what's the people looking to AWA and how AWA can inspire people. And uh, that's something we were searching uh, at that time. And this is the answer to it, because you can see 
uh, Dan Dan Dapper, Dan Dan Barker, Jet Jazz, Spongebob, Joaquin Castro, uh, Jim French, Jeff Love, they are all AIW members. For years, uh, we have been trying to look into the core of AIW values, and uh, we certainly have a lot of talents. We don't need to look for, of course, it's okay. You know, we also work for other organizations, but how would do we convince people? We have a group of wonderful people and the, the people they should join in AIW. And uh, these are all AIW members. And uh, and, uh, and a lot of people in this team, they are also AIW members. And it's like a flagship, you know, to tell people, we don't even have to speak out, you know, it just it, it, the events speak out for themselves. Uh, and, uh, and you can see actually this group of people, they, this wonderful NASA project, they were ahead of SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin by 20 years. And uh, this is so inspiring and uh, we got overwhelming uh, uh, re uh, response. If this is pre-pandemic, we should get this probably 500 people join us, uh, but you can see still people kind of uh, the pandemics which you're still working on. But this actually is a, a kickoff event actually brought us back to the uh, pre-pandemic level. Uh, so really highly appreciate. Uh, so uh, the hybrid meeting really helped because the uh, uh, even though the project at that time, a lot of people were still in Southern California, but uh, later a lot of people spread out across the country. And this event really rekindled uh, the uh, notice for, for this uh, great project, reusable space. And uh, this should be a, a flagship project. I, I mean, uh, uh, kind of a uh, core thing. And we have been over here, we have been trying to work with the AIWA TCs. So I have been talking to several AIWA members and leadership uh, inside and also people inside our outside, outside, uh, or, uh, organization or the Institute, uh, trying to find something that uh, uh, to showcase. To, to help people to understand better AIWA and uh, convince them AIWA is the inspiring organization they should participate and join. Uh, so, um, okay, so lesson learned is that uh, uh, multiple speaker, you know, with different schedule is very difficult. So honestly, this is a very difficult event to arrange uh, because everybody's so busy and for them to converge, uh, we are just, uh, feel so lucky of it. You know, we're just uh, glad it worked out eventually. Otherwise, it, it might, you know, the last moment we thought it might be delayed for another year or two. So it, we are very lucky. But it's a long years of work. But it, it, this, the, uh, ha um, the happening of this event is really purely, I have to say, is uh, thanks to all the speaker and it's a gift from heaven. Uh, the other thing is because, because of this, we learned that we have to do it on Monday afternoon which was actually not the optimal uh, time of the event, but we have no choice. Uh, so, and we have to do a dinner after the event, but unfortunately people have all the excitement. And even though they ordered dinner, uh, some of them, they just left after the uh, Q and A, we're hoping have a networking, uh, but eventually, you know, this wonderful group, you know, they will have a reunion uh, this summer. So they will do their own reunion. So uh, the networking was not really uh, it will be great. We can do it before or after uh, if the, the event could be scheduled in a, in a better time, but that's all we have. So, um, and uh, another lesson learned, I really, well, everybody was extremely happy. You can see the picture here. You can see Jeff in person, Jim in person. You can see uh, Dan, Jess, and Joaquin, you know, and uh, this is a very, very interactive session uh, with in person uh, and, um, uh, and local. So I, I'm not saying that we should not doing the uh, uh, collaboration, which we have been doing multiple times as well. And it's not we are going to uh, say we should not chase uh, a lot of uh, a lot of attending, which we had before too. We have 300, 500 people. But uh, I think because in LA we are at the front line with so many organizations competing here. So we have, have been encountering a lot of issues. So we kind of in the front line fighting for uh, getting attention. So we learn a lot of things. So uh, I, I would just uh, to say is that, uh, in addition to uh, work with our organization, but we also in, but instead of being we are just like a silo of of other organization or um, uh, 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 you know just uh, uh, take a ride with other organization. By uh, you know people will say okay the other organization was great. So what's AI the way? You know, we can do a lot of events. We have can do have uh, thousands of attendees, and uh, but we don't get attention. So this event is kind of one of the I can say experiment or 
kind of answer to it. We'll continue to explore possibility like this, and also with uh, our multi-talent people like you people here and our technical committees. And the technical committees are actually our core of AIAA. So thank you so much, Jane. Sorry, I talked a little bit more, but this is great. This is fun. Thank you, Ken. We appreciate your input. And uh, you did come at it from a little bit of a different perspective, so that was good to see as well. We'll wrap up tonight. Lindsay put into the chat that we're not going to be able to do the breakout sessions, but if you have questions, please do type them into the chat and we will get you answers. And so our final award tonight for the outstanding activity is, again, for a tie in the very large section, is Rocky Mountain for their NSBE AIAA Space Operations Forum 2023. And Marshall Lee, if you are available, we'd like for you to describe your activity. All right, thank you, thank you, Jane. Uh, hello, everyone. First of all, uh, Rocky Mountain Section is honored to uh, receive this award, and I, I think we're especially excited about the collaboration we have with NSBE. It's the National Society of Black Engineers, and fundamentally, this event helped kick off our new uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, which is led by Paul Dedrick, and he's online too. Uh, who he stood up a diversity council. We'll hear a little bit later from him on that. But I wanted to, to tell you the origins of this. Dr. Dexter Johnson of NASA Glenn, he's a NASA technical fellow and AIAA associate fellow, reached out to us right after Thanksgiving and said, hey, he just established a memorandum of understanding from NSBE at the national level with AIAA at the national level to provide a, you know, a, a conduit of collaboration. And he reached out to us to say, hey, we want to put on an event. In fact, the Space City Professionals, NSBE chapter down in Houston, uh, was interested in doing something with Rocky Mountain. So we said, hey, let's do this uh, collaboration. They had a great idea of creating a space operations forum, a working group type setup where it would be a two-day event where NASA actually had some questions about uh, how they would think about transitioning the ISS International Space System, uh, which is going to be, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but NASA is pulling out in 2030, and they want to know how will NASA actually transition to commercial low Earth orbit destinations, which are really uh, commercial space stations. So uh, we had two months, a uh, very aggressive schedule that Paul and I worked with uh, the Space City professionals. Uh, as Walter said, uh, we should have a long lead time for these kind of events, but the folks down in Houston wanted to do this in February. So uh, we rallied and, and pulled together uh, some sponsors. We had NRAIL, National Renewable Energy Lab, host us. Um, and they had two questions that on the first day, the working groups wanted to talk about. And that first question was, what can NASA do to ensure more effective inclusion of underrepresented communities in our effort to enable commercialization of space so that the vision of access to space for all humanity is realized? That was part of the activity. And the second question they had what is your recommendation for how NASA and its astronauts operate in a paradigm where we do not own nor are we operating the orbital platform in LEO, but are just buying a service as one of many customers? So it's all about what are they going to do with ISS and how do we include a lot of groups that are underrepresented? Um, so over the two days, we had five working groups Four of them were in person, and we actually had one virtually going on at the same time. As you can see, uh, who was left at the end of the two days there in the picture and in the screen was our virtual virtual team. And on that second day, each team presented. Uh, before that, we had presentations from the representatives from NASA. We had uh, Vanessa Weish, uh, director of non uh, Johnson Space Flight Center, Jennifer Scott Williams, uh, ISS Research Operations Office, the branch manager. We had Daryl Gaines, uh, he was part of the commercial LEO development programs and other folks from NASA that helped organize this as well as um, local sponsors. So in terms of um, 
perspectives on, on how we uh, conducted this. And it was actually, we had about 40 people per participating in that short notice. Again, so as Walter said, if you plan ahead, you get a lot more participation. Um, and, and as a result, we've opened collaborations with not only NSBE, uh, SWE, SAIS, uh, Global Minded, which is a, a, a underrepresented groups uh, focused on uh, the diverse um, student application and OBAP, that's an organization of black aerospace professionals. And I think um, one of the things that maybe Paul can speak to is when we stood up our committee in diversity, uh, he established a council and I'll let him speak a little bit about his ambassadors. But I think the final thing that I wanted to say is we had never done a, a working group type of uh, forum. And I think that was also a differentiator from some of the things that we've done in the past. And if we had a little more runway, I think we would have uh, had a lot more participation. But uh, we're also now just engaging with the Houston folks uh, to do the second annual Space Operations Forum. This year, we're going to do it down in Houston. So, Paul, if you're still online, you want to talk a little bit about your diversity yeah. council? Yeah, Marshall, thank you. One, one of the things that uh, made the event successful is that we were able to attract people that normally didn't consider themselves aerospace geeks. And even when we came to problem solving, Marshall talked about the two questions that NASA asked. We really got some good answers because of the diverse skill sets we had throughout the room. So that was uh, very successful. And then back to the Diversity Council, the real, uh, I'll say success, were the current members as far as their willingness to go somewhere new. Uh, I have more, I'll say, white men and, and white women uh, on the Diverse Council as well as the groups that you see on the chart. So that has been, uh, I'll say, part of our success. And then the other thing, we looked at what groups uh, that are, I'll say, outside of AIAA, what groups are we going to reach out to and then also document those relationships in MOUs so that uh, beyond our service that those relationships will last. So that was, uh, that's been part of our success. And uh, Marshall, over back over to you. Thank you, Paul. So uh, we're, we're looking to expand other opportunities. Uh, we've got a, our annual technical symposium where a number of these uh, diverse groups will be exhibiting as well. But that, uh, that event's being held at, at Colorado State University. We're expecting four to 500 people. We've got 14 panels, three keynotes, and um, uh, about 20, 25 uh, sponsors. So out of those panels, we probably have 80 speakers. So it's been a lot of herding cats, but uh, I think we're gonna have a successful event. We've got uh, General uh, Shaw from the Space Command. We've got um, Noel uh, from Boeing as uh, Space Exploration. And our, our final um, keynote is gonna be Bob Binken, who was one of the uh, the one of the two astronauts on SpaceX that first went to the ISS. He's going to be our closeout uh, speaker. So looking forward to that. And uh, thanks again for the award. And we'll turn it back over to you, Jane. Thanks. Thank you, Marshall. You guys um, exhibited all two of the um, attributes that we were talking about before, teaming with other um, organizations that are nearby. And then with next year's event being in Houston, teaming with other um, sections that are local or not so local in order to uh, carry on an event. So that was that was excellent. Um, thank you all for all that you do. I'll echo what Mary Scott put into the chat, and that is that you all are what make AIAA great. And these activities definitely show that AIAA is great. You guys are great. Things things are really moving forward. And um, I, we so appreciate all of you and all that you do. And thank you everyone for taking the time today to join us, to help us um, applaud and uh, commend yeah. all of these. Do you have something, Mary? Yeah, if I just might, I just wanna thank Jane and all the regional directors and Lindsay and Molly for all of the work that they've done to support all of our section outreach and um, all the great work that you all do to support all of our initiatives. Um, so greatly appreciated on behalf of AIAA, thank you.
Thanks, Mary. Lindsay, if you'd like to make a final closing statement about when you think the uh, slides will all be available. And folks, I would strongly encourage you, if you see an event that a section did that you think, wow, that looked really great, I think members in my section would really enjoy doing something like that as well, how they did membership recruitment, how they did communications, whatever it may be, feel free to reach out to those folks. Um, you know, you can tell them thank you for doing a great job and ask them for a wee bit of help and letting you do a good job too. So please do reach out to people when you get the copy of these slides and, and have an opportunity to think about it a little bit more. Now, Lindsay, I'll, let, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jane. And thank you to all of the um, activity presenters. I, I think this definitely gave some good perspective as to what all of our sections are doing. And um, thank you to, to all of the winners, all the sections, even if your section didn't win, you all are putting on some really great activities locally. And I, I think the AIAA membership is very appreciative of that. And I know I am as well as Mary and Molly from our staff um, and all of our staff really. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. For, for me, it's tonight. One final thing, I think Peggy has her hand, hand up. Peggy, would you like to add something? Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Lindsay. No, you're fine. Um, yeah, so the, the slides and the recording will be available. I'll send it out tomorrow morning. Um, so yeah, definitely take a look if there's something you want to refer back to. And I'll also be sharing this with all the section officers, even if they didn't attend tonight, because some of these might be some good best practices that they'd want to take a look at. So we'll definitely be sharing these out. And um, if you need help connecting with any of the sections that you saw an activity that you want to get in touch with them, I'm, I'm happy to facilitate that or um, Jane or, or anyone on our staff. So um, yeah, congratulations, everyone. And, and thank you again for attending. And thanks for coming across so many time zones. We really appreciate everybody for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest of your evening or morning if you're in Australia. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you.